Thank you all for coming out. Um, we're going to show the first 15 minutes of Haunters, The Art of the Scare. This is uh, this project has taken me four years. I went down, I thought I was going to film some haunts. I'm going to do a really cool haunted house documentary. I went down a rabbit hole of four years. And I'm so excited with what we ended up with. This is an awesome movie. And I'm excited for you guys to be the first to see the first 15 minutes of the movie. How long have you been waiting to see this? Who's been, who's been waiting uh, months to see this? Who's been waiting years to see this? Me too. Me too. I'm so excited for you to see it. I'm going to ask one thing. We're going to have a Q&A afterwards. Um, and if you have questions, uh, we want to get to your questions too. We have a really cool panel. One thing I'm going to ask is that please, no video of the screen. Um, we're, I, I, I'm really excited that this movie is finally coming out this year. It is coming out this year. You can pre-order it on Amazon, on Blu-ray right now. We're going to talk about the Blu-ray. We're going to talk about the special features. Because I'm tired of special features where it's just like, here's a deleted scene. No. I wanted special features to be special. And they are. It's really cool. That person's probably just heard about the special features. <laughs> <laughs> so what we're going to do now, we're going to show the first 15 minutes. Afterwards, feel free to take some pictures and video. But for right now, this is just for you. This is just for the people who are here right now at Scare LA. Thank you so much for coming out. Thank you for supporting us. I know there's a lot of Kickstarter backers here. Kickstarter backers, where are you at? Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. All right, we're gonna show the first 15 minutes of Haunters, The Art of the Scare. What did you think? So glad. Okay, I, do you guys have questions? Okay, we're, we're going to get to the, some of the questions. First, I'm going to bring up the, some panelists uh, that uh, know this world inside and out. I want to bring up the co-creator of Blackout, Josh Randall. Woo! Over here. Thank you so much. Thanks for being a part of the movie. Really appreciate it. We have from KPBS, Beth Akamato. I ran into her at so many haunts. Including McKamey Manor. She went through McKamey Manor. It's a tour, though, please. Make sure people know. Right. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll get into that. <laughs> and, of course, from We Are Indie Horror, Brian. Where are you at, Brian? From We Are Indie Horror. I'll sit next to you, John. I'll sit right next to me. I'm Brian's sure. actually seen the entire film. Woo! Okay, so. Let's get into it a little bit, everybody. I'm going to straighten my chair out. Thanks for joining me, guys. Uh, first, I want to start with uh, Josh Randall, the yeah. co-creator of Blackout. Thank you so much for being in this film. Blackout started um, in uh, 2009. Can you tell, tell me a little bit about the, uh, the origins of Blackout? Sure. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, thanks for having me uh, in the movie as well. Uh, as John was saying, Blackout started in 2009 in New York. Uh, it was created by myself and my creative partner, Chris, who is still based in New York City. Uh, we have a theatrical background. Um, as, as, as it happens, we literally just wanted to do something in the middle of the summer that was insanely different, and we thought a haunted house in the middle of the summer would kind of be a fun and potentially even funny idea. <clears throat> And there were always sort of three main tenants to any haunted house, which is you're always going to be there with all ages, with groups of, of teenagers as well as older people. You're never going to get touched, and uh, you are always in a group. So we just thought we'd flip that on, on its head, put people through alone, allow them to get touched, and skew the content to an adult-oriented audience. Um, and within two weeks, there was a line around the block to get in, and um, the initial title was called The Midsummer Nightmare, as cheesy and silly as that is. Uh, and then it became something else, and, and probably uh, uh, coalesced into Blackout as we know it about a year later. It's amazing. I mean, Blackout really did kick off a trend of immersive haunts. Who, who's ever been to like an immersive haunted house? Real? Yeah, that's right. It's funny because I kept tracing things back to this movie. I was looking at when haunted houses start. When do they start getting more extreme? When was the first? And everything kept leading me back to Blackout in 2009. And it's been really fascinating to see in such a short period of time how haunts have been getting more 
interactive, immersive, theatrical, and aggressive. You know, and what do you think about all the different um, how how this genre has been expanding? Uh, I, I totally agree. It's astounding how fast uh, this has all happened. And, and as I was saying earlier, literally within two weeks, there was a line around the block. That um, October, we did a second production, and the New York Times picked it up, and BBC picked it up. Um, and then the next year, we did an off-season, and it was the Los Angeles Times, and then Chicago called. So just within the span of one year, the interest uh, grew so quickly, and I think it speaks to the audience here. It speaks to the fact that that is what people wanted. Um, and we weren't, certainly Blackout was not trying for that. I think we just kind of stumbled into it. But I think what ended up happening was all of these amazing artists, all of these amazing creators, it did sort of open a door for them to kind of take it and then run with it in their own unique way. And now we have, you know, such a huge wealth of, of experiences, specifically here in LA, um, that, you know, you can do the hardcore torture thing, you could do the hardcore theater thing, you could do the hardcore, you know, one-on-one uh, -on -one intimate dating thing, and there's so many different versions of it, and I think it's because of the audience. I mean, it's, it's what people want. I mean, it's really interesting. That's what I wanted to do with this movie, because a lot of people, you say Haunted House for Halloween, there are a lot of people out there who think of one thing. They think of an old Victorian mansion. Then you tell them there are no haunts that look like an old Victorian mansion. Not even the, the Haunted Mansion at Disneyland. That's also not an old Victorian mansion. That's why it's the New Orleans section. It's a, you know, it was a plantation setup. So haunted houses are like horror. They have thousands of subgenres now. Just because you say I like horror doesn't mean you like every single subgenre. And now with haunted houses, it's almost like there is there's a different production that's directed for every single taste at this point. That's what I think is so fun. I'm calling them productions because that's what they are. You have to be a visionary to put these on. And I wanted to capture the heart, the horror, the love that they put in, the inspiring moments, the things that are really shocking. And the only way to do that was to open it up and have the traditional, the interactive, and the extreme in one movie. And I'm just so glad they actually opened their doors and helped me out with this. Now, Beth, Beth has actually been to quite a few haunts. I think there's a mic that's right by you, Beth, on a chair over there. It's on the other side. The, the, the chair, it's, it's like an escape room to find the, find, find the mic. So Beth has a, she has a podcast, and she goes to a lot of different, tell them about what your podcast is. Uh, my podcast is called Cinema Junkie. You got and it's on? It's on? Okay. Uh, so the podcast is called Cinema Junkie. Uh, it's mostly on film, but I'm a huge horror fan, so I've dovetailed off of films and covered things like, I've covered uh, Scare LA in a podcast and interviewed Russ McCamey a couple of times and focused on different kinds of uh, things related to horror, so I love it. And you went through McCamey Manor. Yes, I did. I went through to do an NPR story, so I contacted him because I said, like, oh, so I, I, I see you're listed on all these, uh, you know, things saying that yours is one of the most top three extreme, and, and you know, he's like, um, okay, he said, do you want me to come in for an interview? And I said, well, I'd kind of like, I'm going to do a video to go with it, so I'd like to, you know, get you in an environment that looks like, and so then this whole thing says, well, if I did that, I'd have to blindfold you. And then, if I did that, I couldn't let you shoot certain things. And then, it ended up being this, like, if you want to go through it, I'll let you do the interview. And so I thought, all right, why not? But I did, in the back of my head, like I told, I had a cameraman who shot my initial meeting with him because I wasn't allowed to look back. Like, I had to sit, I had to go to a meeting spot with my back to the street and swear not to turn around and um, I cleared this with him. We were going to have a cameraman shoot him coming up and doing the whole, you know, you have to sign the waiver and you have to agree to certain things. And I did tell my camera guy, I said, look, just in case, get a shot of the license plate of the car when it's going away. Uh, I think the only reason I trusted him was that I saw that he worked with Greyhound Dog Rescue. And I thought, all right, how bad could it really be? But, um, and his, 
there's no cost to go in. You have to donate food to the Greyhound Rescue. So those things kind of in the back of my head made me feel safe. <laughs> so, um, but he insisted every step of the way, he kept telling me, you're a media person, I'm giving you the sissy tour. I was there for, I think, four and a half hours. Um, he, as soon as I came, they duct taped my head up with, so I couldn't see, and he took my camera away and my recording equipment. I was like, okay, so how do I do the <laughs> So he promised me that in between rooms or locations that I would get my gear back and I would get to talk to him. So I'd like get hosed down and dumped in something and forced to eat weird food. Then they'd unduct tape me and hand me my camera and my microphone and go, okay, you got like a few minutes, what do you want to ask? And like I couldn't adjust my eyes to the lighting and I was kind of, so uh, it was an interesting experience. I'm glad I went through it. I don't think I would have voluntarily like gone to McCamey Manor just to go through the haunt, but you know, I figured I had a story that I wanted to cover and I was really fascinated. By you got a story. I did get a story. You got a story. I got, I got a video. I had a tarantula crawl on my face, which I was actually kind of happy about. But um, I mean, Russ is a showman. I mean, the thing that I really am fascinated about him is he's like the P.T. Barnum of horror and he, He's caught, when you interview him, he's caught in this bind because on the one hand, he wants to make this extreme, like, oh, it's the scariest thing, people almost die, it's like, but then there's a little piece of his brain that says, well, I can't actually say that people get hurt and I can't, that we don't actually, you know, put you in, you know, we're not actually going to kill you or anything like that. But, so he's caught between being the showman and also making sure he doesn't get into litigation or something. So he's, and he doesn't want you to give away, kind of, it's like a magician. He doesn't want to give away the secrets that make, you know, why this works or the psychology that, well, in your film, you show him interviewing people yes. and asking them what scares you. Don't ever tell him. <laughs> Don't ever like, tell him. Tell, yeah, because he'll use that. He will. Totally I does. mean, that's the funny thing is I saw a lot of people lying about what scares them to try to get away with it and he would look further and find out more stuff and contact their friends and family and find things yeah. out. Like I'll, the thing about Russ was that he really doesn't like the secrets coming out of McCamey Manor yeah. and then after some time he allowed me to just film everything. So we even filmed him building when he was making it more extreme as well and um, I did sometimes have interviews with him that would go on for six hours because I wanted to wear down the showman and hear Russ actually come out and every once in a while it happens. And when that happens, you actually get to learn something about him, about his father, about his past. And it's really fascinating. Each haunter has an incredible past and each one has a reason for why they're doing what they're doing. Um, and uh, we have more stuff to talk about. I want to get to some Q&A also, but this man right here is one of the few who's actually seen the whole movie. I love We Are Indie Horror. If you didn't watch any We Are Indie Horror, do you check out that website? This is one of the guys that reviews everything. His name's Brian. I know it was Brian We Are Indie Horror. That's why I would keep you on my phone. What is your last name? It, it, don't worry about it. But don't worry about it. What, what, what? I'm not going to ask where that's from. It's a Jewish name. It's a Jewish name. Don't worry about it. Okay. So, all right. What did you think of the film? Before I say that, I just want to say that I keep shaking in your shoes. Um, no, <laughs> honestly, it's it's such a great film. I enjoyed it, um, and we had this conversation about it. That uh, one of the things that for me makes Haunters so unique is that being a lifelong fan of haunted houses and a haunter when I was a kid, um, it's great to watch a movie that is very honest and open about the culture of being a haunter. That's what this film is about. The film is not about McKinney Manor. It's not about Blackout. It's not about uh, Char, it's about the people, about the culture, the people behind it, the the stories about them, and what makes them want to be a haunter. And I think that's such a powerful thing to see, you know, because watching through it, like something like McKamey Manor, who uh, we have a podcast called Tea Time of Terror, plug plug, dot com, plug. Uh, and I've actually I wanted to talk to Russ to get him on the podcast, and, and Neil, my partner, said, uh, no, he's not coming to our house. I don't want him to know where we live. <laughs> Straight up. Uh, so we've been like barred to talk to him and so it's been really kind of a scary thing and I want to see and so and you get such a unique look into McCamey Manor that is unbelievable, undescribable. To get to actually get to know Russ um, and to get to see the haunt and there's even parts where, I hope I'm not spoiling anything, where you see videos of him like auditioning his actors and that is one of the most incredible things I've never, ever, ever seen any haunt ever show that, ever. 
and it's just it's amazing. I think uh, I think everybody here, especially like the people that I know that are that are into immersive fonts, and, and they're gonna love it. Thanks, it's gonna be great. Pre-order the film, you guys. Boom. Oh, thank you for saying that. Uh, the pre-order is on Blu-ray. The Brio blah, 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 blah. The Blu-ray pre-order is on Amazon right now. Um, and we have a link to it through Dread Central on our Facebook page. You can also go to our website to find all the links to everything. It's hauntersmovie.com. Hauntersmovie.com. Um, we're going to have a pretty awesome rollout. Um, we're going to have a lot of announcements that are coming up. We have a sign-up list that's that's here. We have actually some people with clipboards here. Um, if you want to sign up, when you get on the email list, then you're going to be the first to know about when it comes available on streaming, when you can see it in L.A. We're doing everything we can to do a special screening in L.A. Um, I, I got to thank all my Kickstarter backers. Thank you so much you know, for believing in this project. Years ago when I first said I'm doing it, and I put four years into this, and I'm so proud of it. I'm proud of the music. What did you think of the music? This is, the music you're hearing, there are two songs from Dead Man's Bones. I loved Dead Man's Bones. And um, that's uh, Zach Shields, who is the co-writer of Krampus, and the co-writer of the new Godzilla. And he's also, um, he's in Night Things, that's his band. Have you heard about the big mystery phone that's in Koreatown right now? That's his mystery phone where you record your dreams. Uh, so he did the music, and uh, also Ryan Gosling, you'll hear him singing every once in a while. Um, Alexander Burke from Save Ferris. Um, Alexander Burke did a lot of great composing of this. Neil Baldock, this is a guy who is, uh, he's worked for Radiohead, Kanye West, he saw what I was doing, said, I want to be a part of that, and then spent two years volunteering and helping out. I couldn't believe it. We have Empty Set. If you've never heard of Empty Set, look them up. I needed something really aggressive for the third act when we really go inside McKinney Manor. They did it. And Jonathan Snipes, the composer of Room 237, The Nightmare, um, He's, he's done so many great movies, and his, his music is phenomenal. Uh, I want to, definitely we can go back here, I want to you to think about what's the future of the art of the scare. Think about that, but first I want to know, if you have a question in the audience, I want to make sure we get to your questions. Right over there. Does someone have a mic they can bring to them? I got it. All right. I'm coming. I'm coming. Here you go. What's your question? Uh, thank you. Uh, one of the questions I have to ask is regarding uh, Russ and McKamey Manor. And um, I've noticed that Russ have received a lot of heat from some of the people that participated in the manor. And my question is, um, what are the notable differences between the participants of McKinney Mead Manor who have grown from that experience at the manor and those individuals that did not grow from that experience, in fact, are angry at, at, at Russ for what he had um, put him through, even though those individuals signed the consent form. Wow, you, you came prepared. You have a question. <laughs> you want to know. You know what? I, you'd have to ask the people that go through it, because the thing is this. I, <laughs> they tried to get me to go through it. He tried real hard to get me to go through it. He was rebuilding it. He like cover, had Carol cover my eyes and they started bringing me into it and I started screaming, get me out of here! <laughs> it's just, it was too much for me. I just couldn't, just the idea of it, I can't do it. Um, the thing is this, you can agree to do McKamey Manor, watch all the videos that you want, but no one's gonna tell you what it's gonna smell like when you're in there, what it's gonna feel like to be in there, and that's the question I kept asking Russ over and over again. Why don't you have a say for it? Because you realize it's, it's hours and hours and hours, and there's no safe word. And I, there was one time I dropped the camera because I saw somebody look like she went into shock. Christina, Christina Buster, are you here? Is she here? Uh, so if you're here, make a noise. No, okay. So Christina, I saw a look on her face, and I was like, it looks like she went into shock. I just, I just dropped the camera, went and grabbed her, and said, you got to stop, I think she's in shock. And he's like, you do? And I just picked her up, and she wasn't reacting. Brought her into the house, sat her down on the couch. 30 minutes later, she goes, why am I not in the haunted house anymore? <laughs> I said, because I think you went into shock. She goes, I flew 19 hours for this. She flew, she's an American contract worker working in Kuwait. Flew 19, she goes, I flew 19, put me back in there. I'm like, 
I'm not putting you anywhere. Russ comes out, he's like, hey, how you doing? She goes, screw you, put me back in the haunt. What's wrong with you? And she's yelling at him, this is what I want. He brings her back in for four more hours. At the end, she's just thanking her, covered and covered and everything, missing hair. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Went back four more times. I have stopped going, oh, this is who this is for and this is who this isn't for. I don't know. I don't know anything. But the thing that's so fascinating is the backgrounds of people who did go through it were someone who works in a cubicle all day, other people who are thrill seekers, moms, dads. It was really incredible. I mean, watching your crowd at Blackout and meeting your crowd at Blackout, I, I met everyone from, you know, frat house guys, you know, people in fraternities, to a young woman who, you know, had a, a couple of lip rings, and then I said, what would you think? She goes, yeah, it could have been even more intense, but I liked it a lot. And meanwhile, full-grown men coming out crying and shaking. So it's amazing. I think one thing we discovered while making this movie, and there's a really interesting part of the movie where we really go through the history. I wanted to know why haunts started getting more extreme and when they started to actually make more money. I noticed in 2001, that Halloween in 2001 was one of the biggest Halloweens on record. And I was thinking, oh my God, September 11, 2001, that October, more people went to haunted houses, went to the theme park haunts, and watched horror films than any other year before that. Because we, we want some kind of a release, some kind of like, I call it scarapy. 2008 beat 2001. 2008, the financial meltdown. The more I was looking into it, the more I was saying, well, our culture sometimes needs to scream our head off. When I go through a haunt, I scream my head off. The first time I first time I actually saw Char, Char is right over here, stand up Char. Yay! One of the greatest monsters of all time. I, she's a legend and she's there's very few people who have worked every kind of haunt you could possibly do. She has, and she was also in a show called Play Dead. Yay! Play Dead, if you haven't seen it, it is it's Todd Robbins the greatest storyteller alive, telling you true stories of creepy murders, and as he's telling you these stories, scary, bloody, violent things start happening all around you. When she popped out, I almost fell out of my seat. I was screaming my head off. She scared me so bad. And ever since, you know, getting to know Char, it's like getting to know a lot of the other monsters and a lot of the other people that, that make us scream. They're the nicest people out there, of course. You know, it's incredible. You know, it's a it's a wonderful community, and I wanted to make something epic for the Halloween community. I wanted to make something that your friends or your spouses that don't get it, that don't get Halloween, that don't get horror, that go, what, why, what's wrong with you? Why do you why do you like this so much? After they watch this, they get it. After they watch it and they see the extreme ones and the traditional ones, then they get, oh wow. These are really sweet over here, and maybe that one's not for me, or that's what I've been looking for because those don't scare me. It's really fun to see the the arguments people have been getting into afterwards, <laughs> the debates that people have been getting into. But I filmed like I filmed for four years, so I filmed over 250 hours of footage. Yes, um, and we got special features. So I put together seven bonus featurettes, they're mini documentaries. One of them we've been showing at our booth, 636 over here, of, is of Haunted Overload. Haunted Overload is in New Hampshire. It's one of the largest independent haunts ever. The, some of their props are four stories tall. It's absolutely, and we, we have some amazing footage of these giant structures being built. It's absolutely incredible. And uh, we, um, so the, the, the bonus features are fun because actually all the celebrities are in the bonus features. It's a, a lot of them are. Um, Slash is in the bonus features uh, with John Murdy. You get into John Murdy's past and he even shares pictures from his first haunted house he ever did when he was a kid. The year Star Wars came out, he did a Star Wars haunted house and made the costumes. He had a Clockwork Orange haunted house. I don't know how that one played out, but the pictures are in there, it's great. Um, I wanted the special features to really be special, and they really are. It's really exciting to watch. Any other questions out there?
Yes, right over here. So with, with a documentary that looks over such a broad range of all the sub-genres of horror or um, haunts, have you thought of taking more of a deep exploration of specific subgenres and haunts, such as an immersive theater documentary or um, you know an extreme haunt documentary or even a home haunt documentary? You're exactly right. I mean, there. I want to do a series. I would love to do a series where we can get deeper into every story. I mean, we actually have one of the bonus features is it's an eight-minute special feature of delusion. You get like four years of delusion in eight minutes. And you get to watch John Braver directing, you see the stunt rehearsals, you get to see the reactions, and you get to see what, what they have to do in order to pull that off. That I mean, epic Hollywood stunts in an immersive theater event, that's unbelievable. So yeah, I, want, I really want to do Haunters. The idea was to do it as a movie and then see if we could expand it as a series. I have so much more I want to share. Yeah, I definitely want to do a series and share more. Any other questions out there? Right over here? Right behind you? Hi again. Whoa, this is loud. <laughs> Holy moly. Well, I have a question. So, this is my first time hearing about Haunters. And I was like curious, like, oh, what's this about? And then watching the first 15 minutes, I was like, I'm going to get a pre-order. Do we get a free copy today? <laughs> no, but, uh, babe, but my question here is, were there any highlights that you've learned while creating the film? Any special moments? Kind of that stuff? Look, I learned so much about people making this. That's what was fascinating. I just thought, look, we're going to get into, you know, fight and flight reactions. We have that too. But we also get into every haunter's spouse. And I found out there's a name for that. Thanks to Char, the name of, it's Haunt Widows. <laughs> so you will learn all about Haunt Widows and just how lonely um, it can be in October, September, really August, July, and June that leads up to it <laughs> um, because all their time and resources are put in this. I want to thank my wife so much. Jincha, are you here right now? Oh, she's, Jincha, um, she already wasn't such a giant Haunt fan to begin with. <laughs> and this has been four years. What's been interesting is to watch her really enjoy and love the haunts as it has gone on. Um, some people, when they watch this, they really they want to try a haunt. They want to give it a shot. And then there's other people like in the movie, like with Donald and Jamie, um, his wife is like, wrap it up. <laughs> you've, had a lot, you've had enough of this. So it's, um, but it's interesting to see how everyone's story turns out also. To see how Char's story turns out, Russ's, and Donald's. And, um, and also to see a little bit of glimpse of the future of, um, of where haunting can go. Um, we'll grab a couple more questions. I want to get back Thank to the you. panel. Anybody else have a question? October 3rd is the release date, everyone. October 3rd. If you're on the email list, you will get information about the release. Um, but yeah, we're going to be on all the different platforms. And I have a really cool announcement. We have distribution. Yeah. Yes. Cinedime. Cinedime is releasing it. I'm so excited. Um, they, they, have a, they have a lot of big titles that are coming out right now. One with Nicole Kidman, and I'm like, hey, I, my movie's like the Nicole Kidman of uh, Haunted House movies. <laughs> so it's really, uh, it's really exciting. There's going to be some huge announcements that are going out next week. So get on the email list, because then you'll find out, you'll be the first to find out what's happening, where you can see the movie next, and where it's going. Because we're doing everything we can to get this thing out there. I really want the culture of Halloween and horror attractions to get out there um, so people understand what it is. Because it, millions of people go, but there's so many who just don't even, they don't understand the story behind what inspires someone to sacrifice everything to make one of these. I hope you guys have been thinking about it. What do you think is the future of haunting? Uh, I don't know. Uh, but I, I think what I see happening, um, and and my prediction is going to be there's there's going to be a, a simplification of everything that we're doing, and and I think that 
uh, for a very long time the sort of the traditional haunt, the big fire breathing dragons and scary people jumping out was the sort of thing to do and then you know it, around 2009 it all sort of shifted into the immersive extreme world um, and I think there's something about that's gonna start happening where all those ideas are gonna start getting synthesized into one simple manifestation of what the haunted house is and if that's an a fear experience, if that's um, an anxiety experience, I, I think it's up to the creators to figure it out. But uh, there's been a lot of expansion lately, and uh, generally after expansion, um, things start uh, going inward. So I, I, I predict more simplicity and more uh, uh, simple, uh, synthesized, smaller productions. That's really interesting because we've seen that with horror films too. There was a time when it was a ton of slasher films and then we pulled back and then we pulled back into supernatural films with found footage like paranormal and you're waiting for something to happen, you're waiting for it, then it happens, it scares you, which then goes back to what? Huge productions like The Conjuring and then all of a sudden the slashers are coming back. It's, it's interesting how it does come in waves. Beth, what do you think? Well, I think it takes a lot more to get people out of their homes. Like, it's so easy to just watch movies, streaming, or do whatever it is you want to do sitting in your own home, your home theater. So I think what some of the haunt stuff reflects is those are experiences you can't just have in your living room. And so it draws them out. And I think initially there's a lot of not gimmicks, but I think there's some big things that get people out that they want to be as scared as they can or they want it as extreme as possible. And I think what the future of it may be is it's the ones who are the most creative that are going to be getting the attention and surviving in, in terms of getting that audience. Because I think the gimmicks will start to fade. You know, it's like with 3D. For a while, people are going, like, yeah, I'll pay extra for 3D. And then they go, like, you know, if you just slap 3D onto a lame movie, it doesn't really do anything. So I think if you go to some places where it's just a jump scare by itself, but I mean, things like Delusion you brought up is this more of an immersive theater, and Zombie Joe does it too, and it's more of this experience that gets you involved in a storyline and in an emotional narrative, and that's something that's a little richer than just going through. Although, yeah, there's the haunts for everybody, but I think those kind of experiences are really fascinating, and I think they would have a staying power beyond some of the others. So I think it's going to be creativity. I think you're right, too. It's about creativity, and it's about passion. You can tell yeah. through these experiences who has a real passion for what they're giving you right now. It's funny what you said about 3D, because um, I'm co-owner of the Brain Factory, and we start off just doing 3D, because uh, I'm a huge 3D geek. And it was, it was sad to see how some productions would just slap 3D on. But people like Martin Scorsese, when did Hugo, who really thought about the emotional impact of 3D, it was incredible. It drew you in. And when you go to these experiences, or you do a virtual reality experience, have you, has, did anyone have a chance to do Flatline VR? So flatlinevr.com. Um, so I am the director, producer, and creator, and co-developer of, um, of Flatline VR. Um, you actually go through someone's near-death experience in virtual reality. And I was working on that while doing the last of the post-production for this. <laughs> it was a real kind of a journey, but it's interesting to see that there's haunts that are coming out this year that are gonna have virtual reality components to them. I think using technology, but also not using technology and having real primal moments, that's what really gets us going. That's what helps makes us uh, feel like a kid again. We are indie horror. Um, I'm gonna tell you what I would like to see in the future of haunts, and I hope you're listening. <laughs> Um, I think that a lot of, it's going to be a mix of like, kind of like what Tension has done with the movie R100, which I don't know if anybody here has seen, but it's basically a movie about where a guy signs up for an in real life dominatrix that comes to his house and messes with him. It's great. It's great. It's a Japanese film. But uh, I think people want to see those lines blurred, you know, where we go to a haunt and you walk through a maze, and then we want to get a little bit more extreme, so you give them a one-on-one -on -one interactive experience, and then we want to go a little bit more, so we put them in these horror stories. And I think people want those lines blurred a little bit more. Now you get something like uh, Tension and Lust, which has been really popular out here, that starts six months before you even walk into a thing with a random email. Like, it's not even... The, the newest immersive theater, the newest extreme haunts that we're seeing aren't 
giving you posters, go to this date, this time, and this place. They're making you work for it. They're making you feel like you're not going to a haunt, you're going to a cult, or you're joining, you know, a witch's, and you're, they, I think it's, uh, it's gonna just become more real feeling, you know? Like, whatever the haunt is about, whatever the story that they're trying to tell you, it's, it's, it's gonna blur the line between the haunt and real life. And you're gonna... You know, it, it's like the movie The Game with Michael Douglas. Yeah. Who yeah. saw The Game? David Fincher classic. It really feels like there's a lot of attractions that have created the real life version of the game. Now, Josh, what is in store for Blackout for 2017? Uh, there are two things coming up in the next couple months. Uh, there will be a new Blackout show. Uh, it's going to be very small scale, but uh, that's happening. Um, and then I'm also working on another. Uh, uh, I'll call it an immersive radio play version of In Cold Blood uh, that's going to be starting uh, most likely in about a month here in L.A. And that's not Blackout, but that's me. <laughs> that's awesome. That's awesome. I also want to give a shout out to uh, 3D Live um, AXO. 3D Live, they did all of the artwork and the virtual reality technology for Flatline. They were amazing. And you should check them out because they do 3D for some of your favorite concerts where you see the performer on stage and they have these environments that swirl all around them and come and touch you with the audience. It's really wild. It's really incredible. So yeah, the film comes out October 3rd. Pre-orders are on Amazon right now. Um, and I want to make sure we can raffle off some shirts. Do you have the raffle tickets? Who, who here, you got raffle tickets as you were coming in? You didn't? Okay. Well, you know what we could do? Um, come to my booth. <laughs> we're going to get your raffle tickets, and we're going to raffle off the rest of the Kickstarter shirts. As a big thank you to everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you all for coming out. And um, October 3rd. October 3rd's out. Get your Blu-ray for yours. Sign up. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you.